and we move on to our uh, uh, celebration part. But um, Hanukkah. Hanukkah. Should we celebrate Hanukkah? Should we not? Should we even consider Hanukkah? What is Hanukkah? Is Hanukkah in the Bible? What are the circumstances around Hanukkah? These are all the questions that I've asked. You know, when I'm, I'm doing research on a topic, it takes me a long time. I, I'm not just a reader. Just read through it and I'm done. It takes me weeks to prepare. So when I knew uh, that I would have to teach on this week, which was three weeks ago, I had to, I went home right away and, and, and I read back through it again and studied up on it. But that's never it for me. Up until the time I have to teach, I'm really intense on looking at information. And this was no easy task. And I will say from the very beginning, I'm still perplexed. This is hard. Some questions I'll be able to answer, yes. But the totality of it, the vastness of Hanukkah, I don't think I've been able to reach. But what I have, I will share. So what is Hanukkah? Let's start with even first of all, Hanukkah itself. Just the mere title of the word Hanukkah means 25th of a certain month or a Hebrew month. And it is the 25th Kesle Viv or the 25th of uh, Kesle Viv, the 25th day of that Hebrew month. And there's a particular reason in my search that I found that they started with that date. But before I go there, let me, before I forget, I want to draw a correlation between Kwanzaa and Hanukkah. First of all, it sounds similar. And if you look at the attributes of Kwanzaa, the seven candles and the seven different attributes, um, each one representing the character of a person of which you are to aspire. Each one in, in uh, Kwanzaa, if I said Hanukkah, but I meant Kwanzaa, in Kwanzaa there, there are seven candles. There are seven candles for Kwanzaa. But each one represents a different and specific character that one should aspire to. I won't go through everything because I need to really try to condense. But those seven are a replica of basically your morals. Now, uh, Professor Kuange, and if I remember the correct date, I'm, 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 and I know I'm going to make a mistake on this because I didn't get a chance. I really forgot to go back and revisit the date on this, but I just realized that I needed to plug this in. It was either 1966 or 1986. I just remember six being in there. Um, so it was either 66 or 86. I'll check and verify. But he went into Africa and he saw something, an event taking place. And he saw that it was taking place over a number of days. And it was the tradition of the Africans that he saw and fell in love with. 
And he brought it back to the United States and said, now this is before he named it. He, he gave the name Kwanzaa and the different um, attributes that he put to it. But what he was doing was trying to copy what he had seen in Africa. <coughs> With that said, with that said, um, he began to shape and mold this event around something that would take pride in self-esteem uh, uh, to the, the black culture in the United States. So when he put it all together and gave the package and um, presented it, it took form and they began to celebrate what is now called Kwanzaa. And each year they would dress up in African attire and a matter of fact, we went to a celebration a few years ago I don't think we sung, but I know we danced. We did do a dance, and it was it was huge. African American, they filled up a gym, and they had music and singing and dance for some time, and they were quite taken by what we, you know, we came in with our Af our Hebrew attire. And they looked at it as African attire, and the singing that we did, we had to explain, or the dancing, we had to explain it was from our Hebrew culture as well. But they saw the similarities, and uh, needless to say, uh, we had a lot of sidebar conversations over that. But now, what I see is a correlation between Kwanzaa and Hanukkah, being in the character of dedication of oneself, as well as the lighting of the candles, as well as the unity of the family, which is one of the uh, characters, and bringing back the whole family to the focus of family. Now, I want to go into Daniel's chapter 8, and we're going to kind of shed some light on some things. By the time I come back to, to Hanukkah, I want to just kind of look at some, some biblical truths. I have also my scripture, my Jerusalem Bible with me today, of which I will go into another book of which I will, um, it is the book of Maccabees. Most of our scriptures do not have that, but for some reason this scripture is a little bit older. Now, let me, let me state for the record that our King James is only 400 years old. Right. It's only been in existence for 400 years. So they just celebrated as of 2011 the 400th year. So if we were to go back 405 years, it did not exist. Right. So where did we get our information from? There had to be someone studying before 400 years ago, 500 years ago, even a thousand years ago. We see the scriptures were around. So this is one of the reasons that I would like to use, hopefully for those who are listening, it doesn't offend anyone, but I am not a King James only. Matter of fact, I have already graduated from King James. <laughs> so we have gone back to the scroll that is thousands of years old. And the scroll is what Yahweh told his appointed persons to write. And Yahweh himself wrote and had them translate. 
on the mountain. So, chapter 8, let me start at chapter 1. Let's start at chapter 1 of Daniel, so, so we can get a foundation. Brothers, do you have uh, uh, Maccabees? You can pull that up after we go through this. All right. Chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Yochim, uh, Yehoiakim, sovereign of Yehudim, or Yehuda, which is Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, sovereign of Babel, Babel, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And Yahweh gave Jehoiakim, sovereign of Yehuda, into his hand. With some of the utensils of the house of Elohim, which he brought to the land of Shekhar, to the house of his mighty one. And he brought the utensils into the treasure house of his mighty one. Now, who is his mighty one? Or who is his God? So, let's go to chapter 8. And verse, let's start at verse 13. Here's where I need you to kind of just stay with me just a little bit. I won't go into um, numbers too much, and that is calculations. But for me, that's how I make connections. Because I need to know chronologically where things fit. Because if you just give me a bunch of history, I can't really see the picture. I, I hear it. But I really don't understand it until I start chronologically putting things into place. For them to take and overtake Jerusalem, and to take all that was in Jerusalem to another place, and mount things up in their house of God's... What was the atmosphere of the Bible? What, where were we? And this is how we're going to look at Hanukkah, how it comes into play. Because, and I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you now, what I just read is about Hanukkah. We have not really understood it to be Hanukkah, but there's different places. I'll mention only four, but there's more. There's lots more. History, right here in the scripture. But no one said, it's Hanukkah. We only get to understand that in the New Testament. What time it is or what events are going on. Because as they are going on and being written in the Old Testament, we don't get this until the New Testament has come. Now, verse 13. Then I heard a certain set apart one speaking. And another set apart one saying to that certain one who was speaking, let me let me um, just clarify right here. This is Daniel. He said that he heard a set apart one speaking to another set apart one. So we have three entities that are that's our focus here. We have Daniel and a speaker and a listener, whereas Daniel is also listening, but he's listening to the other two conversation, and these other two were not just mad. I'll, I'll just say it like that, so that we know what's coming. All right, it says, Then I heard a certain one set apart speaking, and another set apart one saying to the certain one who was speaking, Till when is the vision concerning that which is continual and the transgression that lays waste 
to be made both the set-apart place and the host to be trampled under foot. And he said to me, for 2,300 nights, then that which is set apart shall be made right. And it came to be when I, Daniel, had been seen, had seen a vision that I had sought to understand and see before me stood having the appearance of a mighty man and I heard a man's voice between the banks of your love. Yeah. Yeah. Who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. Now it should start to come a little clearer as to the conversation that is being taken place. Someone is speaking to Gabriel and Daniel is the listener. But the person or the one, the man that is speaking to Gabriel must be an authority figure to Gabriel because he gave Gabriel a command and listen to what he said. Make this man understand the vision. And he then came near and stood where I stood and when he came I feared and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, son of man, for the vision is for the time of the end. And as he was speaking with me, I fell stunned upon my face to the ground, but he touched me and he made me stand straight and said, look, I am making known to you, Daniel, what shall take place in the latter time of the wrath. And at that appointed time shall be the end. And the ram which you saw having two horns are the sovereign of the media, of the mead and Persia. And the male goat is the sovereign of Greece. Mm -hmm. It should start come come a little clearer now. And the large horn between the uh, its eyes is the first sovereign. And it and that it was broken and four stood up in its place are the four rulerships arising out of the nations but not in its power and in the latter time of the rule when the transgressors have filled up their measure a sovereign fierce of face and and skilled at intrigues shall stand up and his power shall be mighty but not by his own power and he shall destroy incredibly and shall prosper and thrive and destroy mighty men and the set apart people and through his skill he shall make deceit prosper in his hand and hold himself to be great in his heart and destroy many who are at an ease and even stand against the prince of princes yet without hand he shall be broken and what was and what was said in the vision of the evening and the morning is truth and hide the vision, for it is after many days. Now, if you will go to chapter 9 and verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed from the scriptures. Now, let's understand the time frame. Daniel goes back to approximately 600, 605 is what I come up with my research. 
from 605 or 605 down to uh, 536 BC. Now the numbers are descending from high to low, going to zero, basically um, targeting when the Messiah would be here. So we're talking about 600 years, approximate 600 years before Yeshua, our Messiah, was due to be in the earth. So Daniel is also saying that he was reading the scriptures. So that means even 600 years before that understanding. But he didn't understand. So this is why, and if you read through more, you'll, you'll see where he did not understand the first time. And as he went through it again, the messenger came to say, look, Daniel, you have to understand this. And I read what Daniel read and what he was told by the messenger the first time. And I'm going to be honest, I still didn't understand either. So I am still perplexed. But what I do understand is that the, the next prophet that was also included a few years later helped me to understand. So I understand a little more now. I do. And as always, I always have to pray and ask Father, please help me. Because I was struggling with understanding. So I will, I will give you what I understand. And I won't go too far into numbers, but I have to make sense out of time. Now, um, to finish verse 2, and then I'll start. In the first year of the reign, of his reign, I, Daniel, observed from the scriptures the number of the years according to the word of Yahweh given to Jeremiah, who Jeremiah the prophet, for the completion of the waste of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, would be 70 years. Now, this is not hard to understand. It is written in plain English for us, but it is also in the scroll. So that's what makes it very vital for us. It is part of our scriptural reading in the scroll. So that means it has a, a long history. So if it's going to be 70 years, let's start here. And as I said, I will not stay with the numbers, but for just an example, 70 years, there is a lot, a lot we have to deal with as far as the 70 years. But to minimize, only for an example, what did he say? He said 70 years for Jerusalem to be laid waste. Now, we're familiar with uh, Revelation that says this is what the prophet Daniel spoke of time, times, and half time. And uh, the book of Matthew also speaks of a time that says this will be the time of desolation where uh, the temple would be laid waste. Now, what all, all of this laid waste is about, and let's go ahead and put down our 2300, which was the first number that we received. I searched and I searched and I searched to try to understand the 2300. That was where my complexion comes in. I cannot understand that by itself. I had to go to another prophet to understand this, but the prophet Daniel gave both of them to us. And what we're dealing with in plain sight is three temples. The first temple, the second temple, and the third temple. Now the first temple, we have a 70 year period that has gone between let me, let me use numbers, because then I'll start. Um, I don't want to give incorrect information and it doesn't come up. But 
in 960, the first temple was made, Solomon. Remember his father wanted to make the temple. He could, he, he could not, but Solomon did. And by the way, uh, just a sidebar, Solomon was given, uh, they donated Cyprus wood from uh, Lebanon and, and uh, different places, uh, very strong wood and gold and all these things. I want to also mention that the queen of Sheba also um, donated very heavily to the first temple. Now, how many know that if you start spreading information about wealth, there's some listening ears and people want to know where it's coming from? So into Africa, this queen who was of the lineage of Shem, I'll have to tell you another time how all that connects, but she is a African woman who is of the lineage of Shem, and actually because they are the sons of she uh, Sheba is the son of Ur. Ur is the father of Abraham, uh, grandfather of Abraham. Uh, four generations, I think. But um, Ur is the first Hebrew. His name means to cross over. Now, his son was Sheba, and then later on we see them during the time of Solomon with Bathsheba who comes and they have a heir together. But my mentioning of Sheba is that she donated so much gold that word went out about how much wealth they had. Matter of fact, she had so many oxen and, and, and all the things that were going in, it was just like a trail and everything had gold on it. And she ordered every three years for a shipment to be sucked into Jerusalem again. So much so that when they went in to destroy the first temple, which was on the night of Tishbe Av, the night of Tishbe Av, which is a Hebrew month, and it's the ninth day, the first temple and the second temple was destroyed on the same day. Now, um, this was the year that it was built, but then later on, it was destroyed. And I may have to, I'm thinking this is the time that it was destroyed. I have to go back and check the timing. But both temples were destroyed on the very same day, but years apart. Now, it's 2300. Yahweh is giving us an exact timing and date for, okay, now I'm getting this straight. This is correct. And then 70 AD was the second temple was destroyed. And forgive me because I'm, 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 I'm really going with all my memory and I hate when I'm not getting everything lined up correct where it should be. I feel kind of 
once I get it like it's supposed to stay there. Alright, so now we can we can start seeing a little bit of focus. For 70 years, the, the, the uh, first temple was destroyed in, in 586, but it was built by Solomon in 960. Now, what David was Daniel was told was two times that the temple would be destroyed and two times that the people themselves also would be destroyed as well as the land. So here's our two times here. And this is why they came to Daniel, uh, Gabriel came to Daniel and said, you have to listen, you have to understand, and you have to teach. If you don't, if you don't bring it in, if you don't uh, get it together, the people will be destroyed. Now, things don't just happen by happenstance. For two temples to be destroyed on the same day, years apart, to me that's a sign that Yahweh is not playing. When he said, you have 70 years to get this straight. They had 70 years, and it happened. It was destroyed, and it went from the year 605, it's coming now. From the year 605, when uh, Yahweh spoke by Gabriel to Daniel, he said, you have 70 years. Seven years, it will happen. So what he did was he told them about the first destruction, and he didn't stop there. He said 2,300. Now, this is where my problem came in. But for me to understand this, I had to go to one of the other prophets, which was Ezekiel. This is where it is listed for Ezekiel. 319 days. And we know in the scripture he gives us a day for a year. And then he also gives us a year for a, 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 year for a day or a thousand years for a day. Um, and you have to know your beginning point to find your end point or your end point to find your beginning point. I, I worked on this profusely to try to just use this number. And until about 2 o'clock this morning, I said, I can't. Waking up sometime after 6 o'clock when it's still on my mind, and I've come to the same resolution that I did last year. I don't stop. when I Once I start digging into something, I just dig and dig and dig until I can either prove it or disprove it. Now, if we seven times this, which we've already known because we, we've talked about this before, we come out to 2,730 days or years. So till when? This is what was asked. Will this happen? He said 2,300. If we, if we take away what is missing from here is the Egyptian bondage when they were, when they were in Egypt. So what Father is saying to us now, take away the Egyptian enslavement. Okay, so we got the first temple because when they came out, when they came out of Egypt, they built the temple, you know, this was years after they made the uh, uh, tabernacle in the wilderness, they had the temple itself, and then um, it was burnt down after 70 years that happened, and then uh, 586, 70 years again, and the temple, the second temple was rededicated. So I see that 70, very effective, 
in tiny. Okay? And you don't have to try to, you know, memorize all this because I'm having a hard time with myself. But just understand that when he says, you only have 70 years, you only have 70 years. Now, how does this play out in our time? This 2300 days, mornings and evenings, is now what the third temple, because we have now the third temple, correct? Amen. But it is the target of the third temple. Because when, when we read that part that said uh, 23, let me read it again so we can verify. Uh, verse 13, Daniel chapter 8, it says, To when is the vision concerning that which is continual and the transgressions that lays waste to be made to make both the center part place and the host to be trampled underfoot. Now we know that the scripture talks about being trampled underfoot, correct? Right. Revelation talks about a time of 42 months that Jerusalem again will be trampled underfoot. So that means that we still have to keep both of these in focus. So I'm really not going to leave these two here. I'm not going to go too much into anything else far as time. But this is my focus. The 70 years and the 2300 and how I came to a calculation. And then I'm going to read through, we're going to go specifically into that time span. All right. The first one, the first captivity was in Egypt. The Hebrew slaves coming out of Egypt, it was a total of 430 years. So if we add that to this, it brings this into focus. Now I can deal with it. Once I've seen this, I take away today's date. What, is, what year are we in? 2000 what? 2011. If we take away 2011, we would go back to the Babylonian captivity. The Babylonian captivity was seven, 22, excuse me, the Babylonian captivity was 586. That's when they were burnt out, everybody went into slavery, those who lived. Some escaped, went back into Africa. But those who did not escape were carried away in control of Greece. Now, here is the Assyrian captivity. So if we were to take today's date, away from this whole calculation, and this comes out of directly out of um, Ezekiel chapter four. Okay, he tells him to lay on his left hand side for 390 days for Israel, but on his right side for 40 days, and he said, I have put on you a year for a day, but they did not come out until 70. So there's something about that 30 days, that or 30 years added, which takes us to the 70. So our focus must be on these two figures here. Now, what he is pointing to is the time, and I didn't finish reading it, so let me go ahead and finish reading that, so that we see what our focus is. To when is the vision concerning that which is continual, and the transgression that which lays waste, to make both the set apart place and the host to be trampled underfoot. And he said to me, for 2,300 nights, then that which is set apart shall be made right. So in this, what we have to know and understand that out of two temples, it has not been made right yet. So the last part that is made right, and I'm closing it out once I uh, read a little bit. 
he's talking about the third temple and the people who will attend, the people who will be in the land, and Jerusalem itself, all will be made right. In other words, redemption will happen and never again. What has happened twice before will happen again. So how do we see this? He's saying the third temple is the picture of redemption in the earth and the start of man or humanity being able to come once again to the temple in Jerusalem and the blood of the Lamb that was slain for all of us, that things once again will be made right, our time will be, um, he will be bound for 1,000 years. So that's what this time is pointing to. And the absence of, the absence of the Egyptian enslavement tells me that these two are not what this focus is on, but the 70 year is. How do we know? Because 70 AD, even though they changed the time, starting from zero, 70 years later, Jerusalem once again was burnt out, enslaved, and carried off. So that's the illustration of time. Now, let's go to the book of Maccabees and I'll close it out. Once again, this is, it is regular scripture, but in this particular one, you have a few more of the books. And how many know it's older than 400 years. Yeah. Not this particular book, but the culture of the people goes back more than 400 years. That's right. <coughs> Let me do this first, just to give a couple more verifications. Somebody give me 2 Kings 24 chapter verse 1, Jeremiah 25 verse 1, and to just kind of just bring in a couple more pieces because now I'm stepping into something that people are not used to. So I want to make sure that we are speaking of the same people of the same time. So what we're going to look at, we're going to verify that we're still talking about the same people, which I believe. And, and what, we, what we know about Daniel's prophecy, he does talk about the Persians, the, the Medes, the um, Greece, and Rome. Now, Rome comes in in this portion, and Greece is in this portion. Um, Rome took over from actually what was called the Seleucid um, era or time, where they enslaved and they took over much of the land, and what they did was took the temple, offered a pig on the altar and erected a statue of Zeus. That was in the temple in Jerusalem and as they were in control the, the king uh, made a decree that anyone, Antiochus, Epiphanes, anyone did not observe all the rituals and rites to their God, they were to be killed. And I won't go into any of the ways, but it wasn't nice. Um, <laughs> it was, it was, it was, it was bad. It was bad. <laughs> All right, um, does anyone have 1st King, 2nd Kings, chapter 24, verse 1? Once you have that, 1st Kings, 
chapter 24, verse 1, Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 1. Just read um, each of those. I just want to bring in the element of the time. Yeah? Okay. 2 Kings 24. Kings 24, verse 1. In the days of Nebuchadnezzar, the sovereign of Babylon came up. Jehoiakim became his servant for three days. But three years, excuse me, and he turned and uh, rebelled against them. All right, so we're still talking about in, in the same time of the Medes where uh, Jehoiakim was the king during this time and he was overtaken. Uh, 20, Jeremiah 25, verse 1, anyone? Read nice and loud. The word that came to Jeremiah, Jeremiah Yahoo concerning all the people of Yehuda in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Yeho Yahu, the sovereign of Yehuda, which was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, sovereign of Babylon. So we, we have verified at least with two and three, because I started out with Daniel 1, verse 1 and 2, that tells us of this particular time that is under King Nebuchadnezzar, and it was his time of coming in. Now, Ezekiel also talks about it, and he goes into it a little more. Yahweh explains why um, during this time it happened. But, well, because, as it always is, because of sin, because they had left the Torah, they had left the laws, they had left the, uh, and this was some, not all. But because of some, they were all, as a community, supposed to be doing this. Remember when they went into the land that Moshe wrote the song? He said that uh, uh, in the time of your grandchildren, your, your, your grandchildren's grandchildren, when you have gone too far and, and you have left the commands of Yahweh, when you have been spewed out of the land, well, this is that time. Okay. Um, and I'm just going to give a little bit of examples from the book of Maccabees. Rabbis, do you have the book of Maccabees? Mm -hmm. Okay, can you go to chapter 1? Uh, uh, first book or second book? First book. And start at verse 16. And as she reading, as she is reading, I want you to notice um, that Africa has a, a part in this, being that Egypt once again is being named. Okay, ready? When Antiochus saw that his kingdom was established, he determined to become king of the land of Egypt, that he might reign over both kingdoms. So he invaded Egypt with a strong force with chariots, elephants, and cavalry, but with a large fleet. He engaged Ptolemy, king of Egypt, in battle. And Ptolemy turned and fled before him, and many were wounded and fell. And they captured the uh, fortified cities in the land of Egypt, and he plundered the land of Egypt. After subduing Egypt, Antiochus returned in the 143rd year. He went up against Israel and came to Jerusalem with a strong force. He arrogantly entered the sanctuary, took the golden table for the bread of the presence and the cups for drinking off drink offerings, the bowls, the golden censers, the curtains, the crowns, and the gold decoration in front of the temple. He stripped it all off. He took the silver and the gold and the costly vessels. He took also the hidden treasures which he found. Taking them all, he departed to his own land. He committed deeds of murder and spoke with great arrogance. Israel mourned deeply in every community. Rulers and elders groaned. Maidens and young men became faint. The beauty of women faded. Every bridegroom took up the lament. The um, uh, lament. 
She who sat in the bridal chamber was mourning. Even the land shook for its inheritance, and all the house of Jacob was clothed with shame. Two years later, the king sent to the cities of Judah a chief collector of tribute, and he came to Jerusalem with a large force. Thank you. As you can see, um, they plundered Jerusalem mightily. Uh, the atrocities that happened against the people themselves, I will not mention. There's some things here, but for the sake of, you know, uh, all our youth, I don't want to paint a gruesome image. But you know what happens in war, okay? Um, so let's just leave that it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't good. So much so that word began to go out to some of the other areas. Now understand that all the Jewish culture or all the tribe of Judah was not in Jerusalem. They were, they were in other areas as well as in Africa already at this point in time. There is an actual letter that's in here that I won't read but they are, they are conversing back and forth with those who are in Egypt and further, I would say, further in and coordinating pretty much like with what we do. And say, at certain time we are going to celebrate, we would be uh, most welcome if you would celebrate it with us at the same time. So they're going through pretty much the same things that we are going through in today's time. But, um, if you will go down, go down to verse... 40, 49, and read some of that. Verse 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 49. Yes. So that they should forget the law and change all the ordinances. And whoever... I'm sorry. Go back up to, so that we get the whole thing. Go back up to 44. And the king sent letters to messengers to Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, and he directed them to follow customs strange to the land, to forbid burnt, forbid burnt offerings and sacrifices and drink offerings in the sanctuary, to profane Sabbaths and feasts, to, to defile the sanctuary and the priests, to build altars and sacred precincts and shrines for idols, to sacrifice swine and unclean animals, and to leave their sons uncircumcised. They were to make themselves abominable by everything unclean and profane, so that they should forget the law and change all the ordinances. Thank you. So, in, now we're talking about Greece, uh, Antiochus. They profaned the Sabbath, and did not allow them to observe the Sabbath. They also profaned all the laws that said you will not observe them. And anyone who observed the laws of Yahweh, the Hebrew God, we will kill you. Basically what they were doing was establishing their own righteousness and to serve their ultimate God, which was Zeus. Now, uh, many people, that is, every apostate from the law rallied to them and, let me go back just a little bit. Okay, I'm going to give just a little bit of how, how things were turned around. Okay, so uh, Judah was to offer sacrifice. Now we're going to another land called um, Modin. M O D E I N. Modin. Which was another piece of um, land which was close to, it was west of Jerusalem. And it says, many people, that is, every apostate from the law rallied around them, and it's talking about uh, Judah, uh, so they commit evil in the country, forcing Israel into hiding, and in all their 
places a refuge on the 25th day of Kesubi in the year 145, the king directed the abomination of desolation about the altar. And the altar was built in the surrounding town of Judah, and incense offered at the door of the house and in the street. And any books of the law that, can, that came to the light were torn up and burned even whenever anyone was discovered possessing a copy of the covenant or practicing the law. The king decreed sentences to uh, death having might on their side. They took action after months against any uh, offenders they discovered in the town of Israel on the 25th of the month sacrifices were offered on the altar erected over the Holocaust of women and so on. Um, chapter 2 In those days, Matthias, son of John, son of Saint, uh, Simon, a priest of the line of uh, Yerubai, left Jerusalem and settled in Modim. He had five sons, John known and so on so uh, He said, alas, that I should have been born to witness the overthrow of my people and to overthrow and the overthrow of the holy city and to sit by while she is delivered over to it, her enemies and the sanctuary into the hands of foreigners. Her temple has become like a man of, a reputation, of no repute. The vessel that was her glory have been carried off as booty. Her babies have been slaughtered in, in the streets. Her young men by the enemy swore. Is there a nation that has not claimed a share of her royal uh, profit, of her royalty? <laughs> that has not taken some of her spoil. All her ornaments have been snatched from her. See how our holy place, our beauty, our glory is laid waste, profaned by pagans. What have we left to live for? Matthias and his sons tore their garments, put on sackcloth and observed deep mourning. And from this point, what Matthias said, and I'll just uh, improvise on the rest. What he said was, it is better for us to die fighting than us to allow Greece, Antiochus, to come and, and just kill us. So he and his five sons agreed to fight. But by this time, they have now come to his township with a decree from the king that said, anyone who does not obey this edict will die. And they went to Matthias and said, you have a reputation in this city, and if you stand and make the sacrifice, the rest of the city will also do likewise. And it drove them to such anger because they had now sacrificed the pig and erected the, um, another statue of Zeus as they were going around there. And he was so moved that he killed the man who was the representative of Greece. And he laid him on the altar and sacrificed him. And then destroyed the altar and ran off and at that point they had such a large crowd that had come because they were waiting to see him make the sacrifice he sacrificed the official destroyed the altar and said we must fight and he and his sons and some of his friends ran off and began to rally themselves now this book is written over 40 years so it wasn't something that happened right away but they began to rally themselves, and this is what he told his sons, it is better for us to die fighting 
than to stand and watch our beloved temple be destroyed. And he began to name people like uh, uh, Phineas, our father. When he said Phineas, our father, for those of you don't, who don't know, that Phineas is also our father. His name means mouth of brass. He is an African descendant. So he said, for what our father has done by spirit, and by what Moses has done, by what David has done, by the different ones that he called, he said, shall we stand by and allow this? No. He said, but we will fight. And by this, they rallied themselves and they hid out, but they would get stronger and stronger as people recognized they were fighting for themselves and people would join themselves to them as a band of uh, um, a band of men that were fighting on behalf of the temple and the people for the people's cause. Someone get um, John chapter 10, verse 22, and I'm going to close out with that. But what I want to show, should we be doing Hanukkah? What actually is Hanukkah? Hanukkah is actually an eight-day celebration of rededicating the temple. In the year 168, if memory serves, is when their rebellion started. Actually, it was about a 20-year period. And one reading from here says, in the year 148 is when they dedicated the temple. I'm not sure because I'm still, you know, dealing with different books that have, the dates are not all, you know, synced up. But, this is when history says the dedication happened. So I'll stay with this. The dedication was, they knocked down after they uh, were able to destroy uh, Antiochus and beat them in the battle, they destroyed the, the, uh, the statue of Zeus, they cleansed the altar, put up a new altar, built a new one because it was defiled and all that they needed to, and told the people, let us go back to our old ways. And they said, on this day, it was destroyed. On this day, we will rededicate the temple. And if someone have uh, John 22, my question would be, what did Yeshua do? Because this was 160, almost 170 years, approximately, before Yeshua came. So this means after this, this time, the temple was in, uh, back in position, and he went to the temple. So what did Yeshua do? So they used this time for eight days, they observed it, and they said, we will do it just as the prophet Nehemiah for eight days when they were able to return. Now, we are returning to Jerusalem, and for eight days, we're going to rededicate the temple. Um, anyone has John chapter 10? Now. At that time, the hunger came to be in Jerusalem, and it was winter. Okay, can you go back a little bit because uh, I need the name Yeshua in there. He has to be either b below it or above it. Go ahead. It's a 23. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, and Yeshua was walking in the set-apart place in the court of Shlomo. Okay, so now go back to the beginning and read all the way down there. At that time, the Hanukkah came to be in Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Yeshua was walking in the set-apart place in the court of Shlomo. Now, for the essence of time, I won't go into the whole thing that was surrounding Yeshua's timing there. 
but we can plainly see that he was in the temple at the time of Hanukkah, which was in the winter. And the King James would list it as the uh, festival of lights feast of or feast of dedication. Now, just like um, tabernacles, they fashioned it after tabernacles for eight days. We see Yeshua doing Hanukkah, we see him at the temple doing Hanukkah. So, uh, a few years ago they had, what is it, JJWD, what did Jesus do? Right. Uh, WWJD. Right, okay. What would Yeshua do? Well, it's in John chapter 10, verse 22, where he was at the time of the Feast of Dedication. He was there at the temple. Now, my last point is that there's a legend that they lit the candle and it stayed lit for eight days. What they did, and this goes back, this goes into the book of Maccabees. Now these are the people who were there during that time. The second book of Maccabees explains it a little more. And what they did is took two books and fused them together. It wasn't that the light, one cruise of oil, lit and stayed for eight days. That was another portion where they went to find the, the continual light that was hidden. And when they found that light or the place where the priest had hidden it, they told the priest where it would be after they came out of their exile of their time. They wouldn't got it. They didn't find the light. What they found was a liquid that had formed from the light. Well, they took that liquid and they put it in the candle or the candle um, in the where menorah. And before they could light it, it lit. So what was hidden was still continual. It was the flame that was to never go out. Yahweh lit it. And that was what people take that part of the, the history and they put it together and say that oil was produced and it lasts for eight days until they can make more oil. That was incorrect. I studied this very intensely and I could not find where there was a proof because that's what I was told and that's what I was also teaching and my wife said, you know, somebody saying that it wasn't like that. And I started looking into it and I said, well, you know what, I need to look at this and really understand this. And last year before I taught on this, I studied it really hard. This year, I studied it really hard. And this is what I've come up with. Are there any questions?